You know what? I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Like the woman shot at point-blank range with an AK-47 assault rifle. A high-caliber bullet aimed directly at her heart. Yet she survives. How? Do things happen for a reason? Will the things we do today affect our future? A child, close to death, is saved by a woman he doesn't know. Years later, the same woman suffers her own near-fatal accident and is saved by the same child. Random coincidence? Or are there mysterious forces of the universe at work? And scientists set out to prove an incredible theory. Okay, you're east. Do cows all face in the same direction? Yep. It's a weird world. And I love it. When it comes to crime stories, I used to think I'd heard everything. After all, I, I used to be a no-nonsense L.A. cop, not to mention the greatest lawyer in history. Well, at least I was pretending to be those things. Anyway, this next weird tale centers on the most bizarre real-life crime scene I have ever come across. An incident I've named The Case of the Bulletproof Breasts. Not switching channels now, are you? The AK-47 assault rifle, otherwise known as the Kalashnikov, designed in Russia during World War II. It's been used by everyone, from the Soviet Union, China, the Viet Cong, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. The AK fires large caliber bullets at a rate of 2,300 feet per second. Twice the speed of sound, it has a killing range of over 1,000 feet. For six decades, it's been one of the world's most popular and effective combat weapons. The AK-47 is designed to kill, which makes the next story all the more unbelievable. A woman shot in the chest at point-blank range. Defying all logic, she survives. Firearm experts test a bizarre hypothesis. Could the victim have been saved by her breast implants? Weird or what? July 1st, 2009, Simi Valley, California. Dental clinic receptionist Lydia Carranza is starting her day. At about 9.30 in the morning, I was checking in a patient. Suddenly, Lydia hears a loud bang from just outside the main office door. I look to my left, down the hallway, there comes this person with a rifle on one side, and he's coming really fast. So the other co-workers that are in the reception area, I tell them, let's go hide in the fax room. A gunman has entered the building. Wasting no time, Lydia quickly hides her co-workers in a back room and dials 911. I thought, you know, this, uh, we'll go hide in the back and maybe he'll just go out through the front door. You know, this person that's trying to rob the place. But the gunman is no thief. He's Jaime Paredes, the estranged husband of Lydia's co-worker, Mariella. Paredes is fueled by rage and armed with an AK-47 assault rifle. Once I heard him yell out her name, I knew it was him and what he was going to do. With clear purpose and murderous intent, Paredes makes his way to where his wife Lydia and the office staff hide in fear for their lives. And I saw the rifle, the office manager, she says, Jaime, you don't have to do this. And he says, I love you. Babe, I told you I was going to do this, and then he shoots her. 
Mariella is killed instantly. Paredes then sets his sight on Lydia. His first shot hits her arm. She hits the floor. I was just thinking of my kids, my family, my granddaughter. She was just a week old. And I just had talked to my daughter 10 minutes before this all happened. And I kept wondering, oh, I hope she, you know, I wonder if she knows what's going on. At point-blank range, Paredes aims the AK-47 directly at Lydia's heart and pulls the trigger. After a standoff, police apprehend Paredes outside the dental premises. Inside, they discover the carnage he has caused. They also find something seemingly miraculous. Lydia is still alive, and she will go on to make a remarkable recovery. How? Lydia's own theory is incredible. My breast implant is what helped, what saved my life. It seems incomprehensible, but Lydia isn't the only person who believes that her breast implants somehow stopped a bullet traveling at 1,600 miles per hour from doing its job. Beverly Hills plastic surgeon Dr. Ashkan Gavami examined Lydia after the shooting. I think it's very plausible that the implant played a vital role in saving her life in this situation. But why and how? Could a clue to the mystery lie in the type of implants Lydia had in her chest? They were made of saline. That a saving implant is under a high pressure system. It's not like silicone, it's not malleable or deformable. So it's kind of like an airbag. So an airbag absorbs a lot of the energy and avoids the windshield and other things coming at you because it acts as a barrier. This acted as a barrier as well, this time in a penetrating injury, so that it takes the burden of absorbing the physical energy. An airbag does the same thing. So it absorbed the physical energy because it itself is a high pressure system. So it needs to release that energy when it gets injured. So when an implant explodes, its energy is distributed widely. So the bullet fragments go with that energy. And so they don't have a chance to give their energy and velocity deeper. It seems plausible, but can the theory that a sack filled with sterile salt solution stop the bullet be proven? Lydia Carranza is shot in the chest at point-blank range by an AK-47 semi-automatic weapon and only suffers minor injury. Doctors later find bullet fragments in her arm and upper body just millimeters from the heart and other vital organs. Thankfully, in this instance, the world's most popular assault rifle failed to do its job. But how? Was this just incredible good luck? No. This is weird. What? Using a test gun that accurately replicates the ballistics of an AK-47, researchers at a research lab in Ottawa, Canada, are going to pit implants against the same caliber bullet with which Lydia was shot. The gelatin block will simulate the damage a person's body would endure if they got in the way of one of these bullets. firing traveling at nearly 2300 feet per second the large caliber bullet goes right through the implant like it wasn't even there well some of the hallmarks of a uh, lethal shot or what we look for are the depth of penetration and as we can see the bullet clearly penetrated the full length of the block so here we are, first frame with the bullet. The second frame is just entering the uh, implant. The third frame's gone through and has entered the gelatin block. And what we can start to see here is an opening within the gelatin block as we move forward. And that would be the, uh, the wound tract inside. We also want to look at uh, how soon did the bullet upset. And we can see that the, the neck length here is relatively short, so the bullet upset early, meaning it began to tumble and change orientation. You can see that the permanent wound channel in here is quite large, and then it uh, gets smaller the further on we go. The implant has had one unexpected effect, but it's not the one that could help save a life. 
The implant, if it did anything, just caused the bullet to destabilize sooner than it would otherwise and actually create a bigger wound channel sooner. The test reveals that head-on, the implant actually made the bullet more deadly. But could recreating the actual angle at which Lydia was shot make a difference? If it had just grazed her breast, then we wouldn't have seen deep fragments. We would have seen injury to her left breast as well, or her left arm or something else, or some of the fragments hitting the furniture. Um, but the fragments all ended up in her, her um, body, and they ended up deep at an angle. So I think she was laying on the ground. The um, gunman was standing and shot her at an angle, and she was covering herself, so her left breast was up a little bit and it, the bullet came in at an angle like this, went through here, and then just stopped right here. For the next experiment, the researchers are going to recreate the angle at which Lydia was shot. Will this have an effect on the bullet's killing power? Loaded and good to go. Firing. We see the path of the bullet entered here, uh, went through the entire width of the implant, exited here. It would appear that traveling through more of the implant has affected the bullet. I think the bullet exited the implant sideways. I think going through more material destabilized it. There's a larger exit wound and uh, certainly blew this all apart like it would if it was going through sideways. And uh, the witness mark on here also indicates that it's sideways. The trajectory stayed the same, but the attitude of the bullet changed. Don't rely on a breast implant to stop a bullet. It's possible the breast implant could have slightly changed the behavior of the bullet as it entered Lydia's body. But judging by today's experiments, not enough to save her from certain death. So, has the implant theory been ruled out? Maybe not. Cosmetic surgeon Dr. Ashkan Kavami believes that, bizarrely, Lydia's breast implants may have helped save her life. To prove it, he's examining the x-rays taken of Lydia's chest just hours after the incident. Here you can see the outline of the heart. You can see all the multiple bullet fragments immediately adjacent to the heart, which means essentially millimeters from entering deeper tissue and to go into the heart. So we're looking at an overlay of those fragments on top of the outer surface um, before the rib cage. Plus, the implants are placed under the muscle. You have an extra layer there, a thick muscle on top. Then you have the implant underneath. Then you have the rib cage and the deep organs under that. So there were multiple layers for that bullet fragment to go across before it had to reach her lungs and heart. And basically, lucky for her, never was able to reach it. Bullets that fragment on impact can be more lethal than those that remain intact. The shrapnel causes multiple pathways of damage through the body, severing nerve tissue and blood vessels, endangering the major organs. But according to Dr. Kavami, the bullet that hit Lydia, while fragmenting, may have had its velocity reduced by her implant. The fact that she had a, essentially a bag full of high pressure filled salt water in it, it acted to be more resistant to a force than her own little amount of breast tissue that she had had she not had the implant and that energy of the fragments when it hit her breast her skin then her fatty tissue then her glandular tissue then the high pressure implant those fragments the energy of them was distributed amongst that area before it had a chance to go deeper and be distributed among vital organs like the heart and lungs so it essentially slowed down and took the burden of a lot of the physical energy of those fragments before they had a chance to go deeper and a lot of this may have to do with the angle the bullet hits, which we don't exactly know. Depending on the angle the bullet hits and where she was sitting, perhaps her arm was a second layer. We don't know all those details, but I do know where the bullet fragments ended up, and we do know that her saline implant was ruptured. So we know that that intervened at some level in her uh, avoiding further injury. But as our lab tests have shown, a regular 762 by 39 millimeter bullet can't be stopped by a breast implant. These bullets stayed intact. So 
Why did the bullet that hit Lydia fragment? Firearms expert Patricia Fan thinks the answer might lie in the type of bullets gunman Jaime Paredes used during his rampage. Because of the way the bullet is manufactured, um, it has a tendency to fragment when it hits an object, whether it be a car door or a person, that particular bullet fragments. There's a possibility that it fragments when it hits a hard object and then the uh, ricochet, as you would call it, could go in and penetrate under the skin. A standard 762 39mm cartridge has a steel core encased by lead and surrounded by copper. This is known as a full metal jacket used mostly by the military. It has superior penetrating capacity. One shot can slice through a car door, armor, and several people without being destabilized. But some 762 39mm bullets like those used by many U.S. hunters, are designed with the lead exposed at the tip. These are sometimes called soft points and are designed to lessen penetration but increase fragmentation or tumbling of the bullet upon impact, maximizing injury. When you shoot these bullets into water, there's that possibility they can fragment and these breast implants were basically a solution or water. From what I understand, it went directly into the side of her breast. I would say then it probably helped save her life. So the theory goes that when the round hit Lydia's chest, the saline implant exploded and the water pressure inside intercepted, redirected, and effectively destroyed the bullet. It seems as though Lydia's incredible survival story could be down to a combination of factors. Her implants, the use of a bullet prone to fragmentation, but mostly pure luck. I now know that your life can be taken at any moment uh, for any reason. You may not have nothing to do with other people's problems, but your life can still be taken just like that. And I'm thankful to God every day for giving me another opportunity to be here with my family because that is what I was praying for when I was there on the floor. Thank God for the implants because I know the damages would have been just worse or I just would not be alive. We've all heard of bulletproof vests, but bulletproof breasts? Is that weird or what? Unbelievable! No, really, I can't believe it. You know how you get that feeling sometimes that you should call someone? Well, out of the blue, this week, I've been thinking about my old friend Ted. But I didn't know how to get in touch with him. Today, I go golfing. It was terrible. I couldn't hit a straight drive to save my life. And one of my balls veers off and hits a guy, the foursome ahead of us. Ah, I rush over to apologize, and who should it be? Ted. What a crazy coincidence. That got me thinking. Small coincidences surprise us, the big ones amaze us, but are coincidences just that? Random occurrences that just happen to coincide? Or is there something more going on here? Could there be a little understood force that draws these events together? Coincidences? Are they weird or what? In 1999, Lorraine Stephen was at a rookie league baseball game near Buffalo, New York with her sons Robbie and Kevin. It was a day that would change their lives forever. We were at Matheson McCarthy Baseball Diamond watching our son Robbie play baseball. My son Kevin was there helping out that night. I was 11 years old, and I was uh, too old to be on the team, so I figured I'd help out, uh, be the bat boy. Kevin was picking up bats, and one of the young players was swinging a bat to practice warming up, 
and on the backswing, he caught Kevin across his chest. I didn't know what it was. It was just kind of a, a hard thud. And I turned around. I, I couldn't really see. Everything was blurry. And I, I said, help, I've been hit. And Kevin took a few steps and just went face first, collapsed on the field. Unknown to those around him, Kevin's heart had taken the full force of the bat and it stopped beating. I remember them rolling him over and just seeing his eyes like just wide open, fixed and dilated, like just no response. It was horrifying, absolutely horrifying. Luckily, Penny Brown, the mother of another boy and who was supposed to be at work, was watching from the stand. He's not breathing. Call an ambulance. Penny is a nurse. So upon witnessing what happened to Kevin, she immediately knew what needed to be done to save him. She started to do CPR on him. That didn't work, so she hit him twice in the chest really hard and restarted Kevin's heart. Everything just slowly started to come back in. I, I started seeing light again, and then um, I had my eyes opened up and I had a really, really bad headache. Penny's fast thinking had saved Kevin's life. Remarkably, this wouldn't be the last time they would meet in an extreme emergency. January 2006, seven years after Kevin's near-death experience, Lorraine Stephen is about to have lunch at the diner where her son Kevin is working in upstate New York. I had a half day off and my son Robbie was home with his girlfriend too. So I said, let's go up to lunch at Hillview Diner and you know, give Kevin a hard time because he has to work today. It was exam week for school. And in the middle of the week, I found out that the exam wasn't going to happen, so I called my manager and said, I can work Friday if you want me to work. And she said, sure, you know, why don't you come in? As Lorraine began her meal, she noticed another customer was starting to choke. So as soon as I saw her put her hands to her neck, I knew she was choking. Her face was red, and she just eked out these words, help me. It was just, it was very scary. All of a sudden, my manager flings open the door and says, oh, get out here, get out here. And I, I thought I had done something wrong. And then I realized, oh my God, this lady's choking. So I ran over there and started performing the Heimlich maneuver. He had to do two thrusts and the food was released and she was breathing again. Kevin's quick thinking and anti-choking maneuver saved the woman's life. But there was something else, something strange Lorraine began to notice. It was at that point that I put it all together. Incredibly, the woman Kevin had saved was the same woman who had saved him seven years before. And then my mom said, Kevin, do you realize who this is? Penny Brown saved your life a few years ago and now you've just saved hers. And I was absolutely in shock. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. In an extraordinary twist, two random events, seven years apart, have thrown the same two people together in a life and death struggle. Is this more than an incredible coincidence? Well, you gotta wonder why Penny was at the baseball diamond that night. She wasn't supposed to be. And you gotta wonder why was my son at work that afternoon when he wasn't supposed to be. Wow! Not just did one person save the life of another person who had saved his, but Neither was supposed to be where they ended up that day. It also took each two attempts to save the life of the other. Not just one coincidence, but three rolled into one. So what's going on here? Could it be just random or could it be something else drawing these seemingly unrelated people together at specific times? Dr. Jeffrey Rosenthal is a professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Toronto. He doesn't believe that these amazing coincidences are really that remarkable. Of course, lots of coincidence stories can be interesting and fun and amusing and they're fun to retell and so on, but uh, I think some people will think that they go a step further and they must have some sort of a cosmic significance or there must be some hidden force which is forcing these magical things to happen. And I don't look at it that way. I would say, well, let's think about the numbers. And when you do, you realize that even really surprising sounding things, it's not that unlikely that at some point something like that will happen to someone. So to me, I don't think there's any secret cosmic force involved. I think these things are just going to happen by chance every now and then. Look at this. Royal flush. The odds of getting a royal flush 
are 1,298,960 possible hands. That's what makes it appear so special. So what are the odds of experiencing an incredible coincidence? To demonstrate how mathematics can demystify seemingly improbable events, Rosenthal performs a simple experiment. Hi everyone, we're doing an experiment about randomness and probability. Oh hi, excuse me, would you like to help us with the science experiment that we're doing? Sure. Okay, all you have to do is you have to write your birthday here and we're going to see if we get two people with the same birthday. Can you do that? Yep. You'd like to help us by telling us their birthdays. Yeah, just take this over there and we're going to see if we get a match. Okay. Thank you. Randomly choosing 40 people from the campus of the University of Toronto, Rosenthal's theory is that at least two people from this group will share the same birthday. Well, you'd think at first it's 365 days in the year, so it's pretty unlikely out of 40 people that some pair will have the same birthday. But actually, there's about an 89% chance that some pair will have the same birthday. And the reason is because there's 780 different pairs of people that you can make out of a group of 40 people. And 780 is actually a lot more than 365. And that's why, with just 40 people, there's actually an 89% chance, it's a very high chance, that there will be uh, some pair of people who have the same birthday. This time, Rosenthal's theory is right. Two of these random people were born on the same day. But does this right. theory apply to the remarkable story of Penny and Kevin? So if you just take a specific pair of people, what's the chance that A saves B's life and then B saves A's life? It's about one chance in 40 billion billion. It's incredibly unlikely. But then once you factor in the fact that there are so many different pairs of people out there who are training CPR, and the fact that people tend to stay within their own local region, and you put that all together and you work it out as best as I can, then you end up saying there's something like a well, one-third chance that at some point during my lifetime there'll be some pair of people living in some local area who will save each other's lives. So can all of these coincidences be explained through a probability formula, or is it really just the law of really big numbers? It seems so cold and heartless. Others believe in a much more mysterious theory. Dr. Gary Schwartz is a professor of psychology at the University of Arizona. He believes random events are not random at all, but caused by something called synchronicity. The term coincidence implies that things happen by chance. So the term coincidence is, even though it is co-incidence or co-occurring, we think coincidence means chance, whereas synchronicity implies that the coincidence is beyond chance, that something else is going on. Were Penny and Kevin destined to meet? Dr. Schwartz believes synchronicity is a powerful, invisible organizing force that orchestrates our lives. A visual way to express how something invisible can organize things that would otherwise be random it comes from physics. So we can take, for example, iron filings and just put them on a piece of paper, and if you just drop them, they'll just spread out haphazardly. There's no specific sequence involved if you're just dropping them. But if there's a magnet underneath the paper, you will begin to see a structure emerge, and that structure reflects the underlying fields that are interconnecting the events. It's a remarkable theory. Were Kevin and Penny drawn together by an underlying force they weren't aware of? Synchronicity applies to this story because there were a set of three improbable events, all of which occurred together, where the whole is greater than some of its parts. So it was not just that they saved each other, which itself is extraordinarily improbable. In each case, they did not expect to be there. So it was a it was a deviation from their normal routine that allowed each one to be present when the other needed them. So that it's the configuration of the multiple conditional probabilities that make it such a unique story. But one question remains. If synchronicity is an invisible force, where is it coming from? At the present time, there's no um, accepted scientific explanation for the mechanism of synchronicity. But there are people who believe that you have to posit the existence of some sort of superintelligence or cosmic term to explain this. Is synchronicity 
really the best explanation for an amazing coincidence? Or is there a better way to look at this? Physicist Dr. Fred Allen Wolf is an author and physics lecturer. He thinks there may be an explanation that's less mystical and grounded in science. In physics, we have two forms of connections that can take place. Connections which take place in a logical fashion, in which it's clear there's a cause and effect, and connections which can take, and those usually take place over time, something in the beginning, something in the end, at one o'clock, two o'clock. Perfectly logical. Take a ball, drop it a few milliseconds after I drop the ball, it hits the ground, cause effect. That's one kind of a thing we can talk about. We know what the law is, we can explain it. Another kind of connection is something which is like synchronicity. Things can become what is called quantum entangled. According to quantum mechanics, it is possible for two similar particles to become linked in such a way that anything that happens to one of them is instantly communicated to the other, regardless of distance. This is called quantum entanglement. Theoretically, any two things that have ever interacted will become entangled and connected forevermore. In the case of Kevin and Penny, it's possible to think of this as the quantum entanglement because the two had interacted and then separated, remaining quantum entangled until they met in the future in which something else set in motion one of the possibilities of the entanglement. Did Penny and Kevin's lives entangle in a remarkable feat of physics? Or were they controlled by a super intelligence beyond our comprehension? Or was it simply a matter of bizarre coincidence? Weird. Or what? One thing I've learned over the years is if you scratch the surface of the seemingly mundane, more often than not, you'll find something straight up weird. Take cows. What do we know about cows? Well, we know they give us milk and leather goods. Scientists suggest that their flatulence is a major contributor to global warming. We also know that if grilled well, cows taste delicious. But what you might not know about our bovine buddies is that they may possess an incredible power. A power that may hold the key to the mysterious forces of our planet. This bizarre story begins in 2008 when zoologist Heinrich Berda was analyzing satellite imagery of the Earth's pastures. We looked uh, at several thousand pastures and the several tens of thousands uh, of, uh, of animals. What he found is remarkable. All over the world, in Europe, Africa, North America, most of the planet's 1.3 billion cows were facing in the same direction, either north or south. Heineck has a theory why. He believes that cows may have the ability to perceive the Earth's magnetic fields. Now, for the first time, researchers are going to try to prove if this power exists. Zoologist Heinek Berda thinks he has discovered the answer to this mystery. He believes that cows have a power called magnetoception. Magnetoception means that the being can really see the magnetic field. Our planet is essentially a giant bar magnet. Inside, a hot liquid iron core sloshes around because of the Earth's rotation. It's theorized that this motion creates the Earth's magnetic fields. Magnetoception is the ability to perceive these magnetic fields like a compass. But hold on. Can a cow really do this? Well, as it turns out, there are other animals that may have this power too. It's theorized that bees, 
Homing pigeons and some other smaller organisms have magnetoception, but until now it has never been observed in a large mammal like a cow. So why do we care? Well, cows share many of the same genes as human beings. So that if cows have this incredible internal GPS system locked away in their brains, so might we. To test his theory, Hynek is traveling to the heart of cattle country in Texas, where, with the help of some local cattle experts, he hopes to prove that cows have magnetoception. Jason Clear, beef cattle specialist of Texas A&M University System. If they did have some kind of receptors, would I think it is strange? Well, probably not, because if you think of the, the way our environment is, how things have changed, and the species and the animals that we have, there's a lot of interesting things that go on there where animals have adapted to the environments and those kind of things and they've done it for one reason or another. I'm not sure that, you know, the data's there to prove or disprove it. Jason Sawyer of Texas AgriLife Research. I've been around cattle most of my life and it was just sort of a natural fit for me to go into research. Kyle Demborski is a Texas A&M physics student. He's been commissioned to build a giant electromagnet to test Hynek's theory. This is definitely in the area of weird science. The electromagnet contains two magnetic coils which are wrapped around this wooden frame. Well, we have two coils. One's lined up north-south, the other is east-west. And based on the direction of the current that we put through the coils, it'll generate a magnetic field, and it's just like turning the Earth's magnetic field. By sending electricity through these coils, they will create magnetic fields in several very specific directions. If the cow turns and aligns with it, like a compass needle, then we have potential evidence of magnetoception. The magnet will generate a field twice as strong as the Earth's magnetic field. If Hynek's theory is correct, the cow will align with the man-made magnetic poles. The experiment begins as Kyle moves the machine's magnetic north due east. Two more leads. But the cow seems unaffected. The animal just seemed to continue to do what he was doing. He, he kind of continued to sniff around. He seemed to get a little bored, saw the grass on the other side. and, and... Uh, So maybe there are other external factors to explain why many cows seem to face north or south. Have you ever had sun in your eyes? Or wind in your face? Maybe something as simple as weather could explain the mystery. You know, I think that cattle in general are probably more complex than most people give them credit for, but that's because most people's experience with cattle is looking at them through a windshield while they're driving down a highway somewhere. For me, I spend most of my day thinking about cattle and because of that maybe I think about them a little harder than most people do and, and so I tend to, to think that they are probably more complex in both their behaviors and their physiology. Perhaps external factors are a clue to solving this mystery. Could it be that the cow's preference to face north or south is related to something simpler, like weather? If we think about environmental conditions, the weather patterns that, that can influence the way that cattle move around, uh, one would be, you know, the wind. If we get a really uh, cold norther that blows in, cattle will, will turn their ears to it and, and try to reduce the amount of wind that's hitting them. They'll also group together as well. To, to try to create some more warmth into it as well. So if a prevailing cold wind is coming from the north, the cows will turn away and face south. And since cows tend to huddle together to minimize heat loss and exposure to the elements, it would appear that the cows were all lined up in the same direction. The other thing too is if we get a really cold day, the sun pops up, they're going to try to, to position themselves to get more of the sun on the, the side of their body, more surface area. Could the fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west explain why cattle all face north or south? Heineck believes that they will do it even on an overcast, windless day like today. 
Experiment number two. Coil one's at full power. Hynek's second attempt is no better than the first. Cow number two doesn't react to any change in the magnetic field. It looks like these bulls are possibly moving to the feeder at the back of the pen, and this one is more or less feeling left out. Experiment number two is a failure. It seems that cows prefer to be in herds. Could this be the reason why they're aligning themselves north or south? These cattlemen believe this herding behavior might be contributing to their alignment to the magnetic poles. Cows have always been herd animals. 10,000 years ago, before Neolithic humans began corralling them for their meat and milk, these beasts would wander great distances searching for food and water. And it wasn't just because these guys loved hanging out. It was because their large numbers helped ward off predators. Herd animals in general, and cattle in particular, exhibit a, a fairly in, intricate social structure within the group. And a lot of times it's easy to think of this as sort of high school kids. So within the herd there will be smaller subgroups. There's usually leaders and followers. And these smaller subgroups form sort of little cliques. And each of those cliques usually has a leader. And then there might be one overall dominant animal in the group. If the lead cow is pointed in a certain direction and traveling in that direction, you'd say that at least the majority of the rest of the herd is also probably going to be oriented more or less in that direction. So if the leader is facing north, so would everyone else. But Heineck thinks that it is likely that herd animals like cows use magnetoception to help them navigate as a group over large distances. The only explanation is the magnetic field. After two failures, the zoologist has one last chance to prove his theory. Let's shift to the magnetic field for 90 degrees to the east. We shall see what happens. OK, you're east. It's a first. The cow actually turned east. Let us confuse the animal. Uh, a bit uh, more. Let us uh, shift uh, the magnetic field uh, in the south. Uh. It appears that the cow's reacting. So actually, now the cow aligned again with the predicted uh, direction. They're going to do it one more time to be sure. All right, you're west. Does this mean the experiment was a success? I have seen some evidence that these animals reacted on changed magnetic field conditions. But to find out if cows really do have magnetoception, more experiments will need to be performed. If it's true, we may be one step closer to unraveling the mysteries of our planet. Is that weird or what? So there we have it, a triple helping of weirdness. A woman survives being shot in the chest by an AK-47 assault rifle at point-blank range. Did her breast implant somehow save her life? A child is saved from certain death by a stranger. Years later, the same woman is also in a potentially fatal accident and is saved by that very same child. Bizarre coincidence, or did mysterious forces bring them together? Around the world, cows are behaving mysteriously. They prefer to stand facing the Earth's magnetic poles. Are they shielding themselves from the elements? Is this simply a herd instinct? Or do our bovine buddies okay, have easy. inbuilt GPS? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what.